you could have potentially you know lethal drones that have that are AI powered that um, might have an explosive payload or something like that at a tactical level. At an operational level, you might have AI systems that kind of integrate different signals at different levels. And at strategic at a strategic level, you might even have uh, you know the possibility of AI enabled strategic weapon systems. So you know one thing that I think is kind of terrifying would be the possibility of using AI uh, you know to control nuclear uh, like nuclear type deterrent weapons and that sort of thing. Yeah, that, that sounds like the ultimate horror. Right, yeah. Welcome to Closer to the Truth. We are pleased to partner with MindFest 2025, led by Professor Susan Schneider on this year's theme, Sentience, Autonomy, and the Future of Human-AI Interaction. Close to the Truth is conducting a series of in-depth discussions with keynoters and participants. Today, I'm pleased to be speaking with Mark Bailey, Department Chair for Cyber Intelligence and Data Science and the Director of the Data Science Intelligence Center at the National Intelligence University. Mark, it's great to meet. Thank you, Robert. It's great to be here. Great. Well, let's explore your new book, Unknowable Minds, Philosophical Insights on AI and Autonomous Weapons. And let's start by challenging the word unknowable, because we know how large language models work, neural networks, transformer models, generative AI, retrieval augmented generation, supervised fine, fine tuning, and, also, and other things. We know that process. So why unknowable? So when I say unknowable, I'm referring to some of the issues that we usually see with AI. And I think a lot of AI theorists typically generalize some of the main problems into like what we call the explainability problem, the alignment problem, and the, the control problem. And these are things that are all related to each other. So explainability is, relates to the inherent unexplainability of, of how language models or how any sort of AI system, uh, well, within certain bounds. Uh, so any sort of, I would consider it like a a stochastic interpolating AI system. So a neural network kind of thing, not necessarily something that's hard coded, but how these types of things come to the conclusions that they come to. So I, I often use the analogy when I'm teaching my classes, I talk about interpolating uh, points with a line. So you can fit two points with a line and you can make some interpolation from that line. And you can fit two parameters to that line. You have a slope and an intercept. And in certain circumstances, you can infer some physical meaning from those from those two parameters. But with, a with any sort of AI system, you might have billions of parameters. So you can't necessarily know exactly what those parameters are going to, are going to mean. So I think we're trying to address this problem. Uh, you know, there are a lot of efforts, I think, to, to try and research this problem and try and ex understand it. But I think it, it creates a level of uncertainty with these types of devices that, that, can, be, that can be troublesome, especially if they're used in what I would consider to be very critical types of uh, types of types of applications where if it fails, it could have significantly bad consequences. Sure. You mentioned three uh, major themes. So articulate each one very clearly. Yeah. So uh, I talked about, you mean the three problems within AI? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so yes. Yeah, so we have, so typically a lot of AI theorists will uh, talk about some of the issues in AI into three, three main problems. So we have the explainability issue which is sort of the fundamental unexplainable nature of some of these types of models. There's the alignment problem, which is how do we ensure that AI behaviors are aligned with human expectations? And then we have the control problem, which relates to how well we can maintain control over AI systems in the event that they kind of do the wrong thing. Mm. Um, and so how do you make progress in each of those three? So I think they're all related. So I think in order to have effective alignment, you have to really have you have to be able to explain how AI works, or at least you have to be able to explain how it's making some inference about, or, or some decision about, about the world. Um, and then in order to have you know, effective control, you have to ensure effective alignment with human expectation. So my book is more of a, a call for epistemic humility in terms of things that we can't necessarily know when we decide to, to integrate AI into these types of uh, you know, highly, highly risky types of systems like autonomous weapons and stuff of that nature. Sure. Um, how do you justify your claim that AI differs from any other technology that humans have ever developed mm -hmm. and why AI poses profound risks for human futures? 
Yeah, absolutely. So I see AI as being inherently different because, because it's not inherently predictable in a lot of ways. So I think a lot of times, for instance, if you consider uh, like a military acquisition process for trying to develop a new technology, it's predicated on this notion that the technology is going to behave reliably and predictably in different types of environments. So you might go through different types of research testing and then some sort of, uh, you know, like beta testing and then perhaps fielding of that particular uh, technology. And then you make these assumptions that it's going to perform reliably and predictably as you deploy it. But that's not necessarily the case with AI. It might behave differently in different environments, and that might be very difficult to predict and difficult to, to anticipate in these types of uh, training, you know, types of training and development scenarios with the device. So, so that's why it's inherently different. It's because it has this sort of inherent level of unpredictability that we don't see in other types of technology, which tend to be very, I would say, relatively deterministic in, in their performance. So let's apply that to uh, AI weapon systems, which is a growing issue in the world and you've uh, focusing on it um, in a very, uh, very special way. And so I think that's, that's very important. Uh, is it a basic principle that must all AI systems ultimately have a human decision maker before a, an action is taken that could be lethal? Yes, and that's the current approach that uh, that at least the U.S. Defense Department is taking, and I think a lot of our European uh, and other allied uh, nations are taking. Um, so, so yeah, I think that's that's a, an important limitation that I think we need to put in place as we, you know, if we're going to go down that path. Um, I don't necessarily think it's sustainable in the long term because I see the main benefit of of AI integration into these types of like military operations is that it increases the speed of action. Right, and Ultimately, you might have multiple AI systems sort of nested within other AI systems, and it might be intractable to have a human at each one of those decision points making some decision because that will inherently slow down the entire process. Yeah, not only that, but you, your basic assumption going in that it has to have a human decision maker and that if uh, the U.S. does that, European countries do that, um, it, it, you only need one that does not do that. And there are certain uh, countries in the world that would be <laughs> candidates uh, for uh, n doing it faster rather than with the control system. And if you do that, uh, you will lose. Yeah. Uh, and so it seems inevitable that we'll be in a world in which humans will not be in the decision process uh, to uh, generate lethality. Right. There seems to be a perverse incentive to move in that direction. So, which is something I think we ought to be prepared for in the event that that happens. So I think, you know, how do you prepare? For, how do you prepare for that? Well, I think in this case, it might require establishing some sort of global norms about appropriate use of AI in military applications. Um, it might be a hard, it might be a hard problem to sell. Uh, but I think, you know, I mean, we, we were able to come to sort of a consensus on things like nuclear weapons and other types of chemical uh, weapons. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I'm hoping that we can do the same sort of thing with AI. Yeah. Uh, and we can use chemical weapons as an example. Of course, the, the horrors in World War One was outlawed, generally um, uh, uh, followed during World War Two, even though that was hor a horrendous. So that that's a good piece of data in terms of uh, of uh, of uh, uh, mutual deterrence on chemical weapons. But of course, we've seen chemical weapons being used. Uh, Syria is an example in the in the previous regime. And so uh, with any of these uh, technologies, if you have one uh, uh, country or non-state actor w willing to, to, to make these uh, extreme decisions, uh, it puts everyone else at risk. So the question is not so much coming up with a, um, a, a global consensus, it's, it, it's enforcing it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that may be a challenge. I think with things like chemical weapons or nuclear weapons, they're inherently easier to control in a lot of ways because you can put export controls on dual use technologies and then you can interdict you know, the sale of those things if, if, uh, you know, if, if certain organizations aren't necessarily following the agreed upon standards for that. But AI is kind of ubiquitous. It's, you know, I mean, you might be able to control the sale of certain types of chips and other types of uh, hardware, but I think it's a little bit more difficult than, than it would be to, to control the, the proliferation of, you know, like 
enabling technologies for chemical or biological or nuclear weapons. Mm. Um, so in, in your book, what are then the the major um, prescriptions that you have given the problems? So it's I'm, I'm more or less trying to in, help, trying to encourage people, policymakers to to really think about this, because I don't know that I really have a, a solution at this point, but I think it's going to require a lot more discussion. So I think we need to be able to reflect on the three main problems with AI that I mentioned. And then also I introduced the uh, distributed AI problem, which is which has to do with uh, sort of the, the propagated uncertainty in multiple AI systems interacting with each other. Mm. So I think policymakers, military leaders, uh, world leaders need to sort of consider these problems. And then also I think consider some of the ethical and moral implications of allowing machines to make the decision that humans ought to live or die in a battlefield. What's an example of a weapon systems that would have multiple uh, nesting of AI systems? Well, what I would imagine, I don't know that any necessarily exists that, that would exist at all levels of war. So you have like strategic operational and tactical levels. Um, but I could see certain, you know, you could have potentially, you know, lethal drones that have, that are AI powered that um, might have an explosive payload or something like that at a tactical level. At an operational level, you might have AI systems that kind of integrate different signals at different levels. And as strategic, at a strategic level, you might even have, uh, you know, the possibility of AI enabled strategic weapon systems. So, you know, one thing that I think is kind of terrifying would be the possibility of using AI, uh, you know, to control nuclear, uh, like nuclear type deterrent weapons and that sort of thing. Yeah, that, that sounds like the ultimate horror. Right, yeah. Um, you also talk about uh, what you think is the real long-term dangers of AI. What is that? So I think, I think they're, they're ten within the AI safety community, I think some people tend to focus on the long-term risks of AI as being sort of the emergence of this super intelligent AI singleton that wants to enslave or destroy humanity. So these kinds of like very science fiction-y Terminator-like scenarios, um, which I think are interesting to ponder but I really think the real risk is already manifest in, in sort of the complexity of, of these types of AI systems and how they may interact in the future. And the fact that we tend to, we don't really, I think sometimes we like to just develop technology for the sake of developing technology and don't necessarily think of the inherent risks. So we ask the positivist question as to whether or not we can do something and not necessarily the normative question as to whether or not we should. And so I think if we go too far down that rabbit hole, you know, we might run into some of these problems with, you know, with the inherent uncertainty in AI. And I think that's sort of the real risk that we kind of, that we see today. Are you optimistic? I try to be. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I'm hoping that, you know, we can develop some sort of global consensus on this. Um, I'm glad to see that, you know, we have international forums that are talking about AI. Um, and I think those those dialogues need to need to continue. And uh, in those dialogues, the critical factor will be how do you enforce close to 100% um, compliance, uh, because that will be the ultimate issue. Yeah, and I don't, I, you know, even with chemical and biological weapons and things of that nature, it's it's never going to be 100%. So the ultimate challenge is to enforce compliance by every potential actor, be they state or non-state. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think that's going to take, it'll take a lot of global cooperation, um, you know, a lot of determination as to what ought to be controlled as it relates to AI technology. Um, and, you know, it'll probably have to look similar to how we control uh, the export of, of enabling technologies for, for chemical and biological and nuclear types of weapons. Hmm. Okay, let's do some short questions and very short answers uh, from your perspective. Uh, number one, can AI ever become conscious similar to how we are conscious? Zero to 100, zero meaning impossible, 100 meaning it's surely coming. Probably 50. I okay. think, yeah, it's, I'd say it's about even. It's, it, I think consciousness is something that we have trouble explaining in humans. So I think it would be even more difficult for us to, to explain it in what's inherently an unknowable mind. Two, uh, is virtual immortality possible, which means uploading our first person consciousness, not a digital clone, but actually you, zero to 100? I would say 
maybe 40 on that. I think there's something, unless there's some substance to consciousness that can be uploaded, uh, you know, I don't think that will be possible, um, but we don't really know that yet. So it could be an inherent feature of, you know, of, of simply being human or being alive or, or something um, that's sort of inseparable from that. Three, will AI generate very unpleasant surprises for humanity? Zero to 100. I'd say probably 90. Uh, it's inherently unpredictable in a lot of ways and already does some things that are really odd. And I think that will only get worse as AI becomes more advanced. Okay. Four, the ultimate human future is transhumanism melding with AI. Zero to 100. I would say maybe 20 on that. I think, you know, we ought to reflect on what it means to be human and whether or not, you know, any sort of merger with our technology, a convergence would displace us from our humanity in ways that would be undesirable. Last question. The ultimate future is non-human, all AI, no humans, zero to a hundred. Maybe 40. Hopefully it doesn't get to that point. <laughs> okay, many thanks, Mark. Viewers can watch more MindFest 2025 videos on the Closer to Truth website and YouTube channel. Also over 1,500 videos and more than 100 TV episodes on consciousness, all facets, free will, personal identity, life after death, cosmic consciousness, parapsychology, but all infused with Closer to Truth critical thinking. Thanks for watching. Thank you, Robert. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please like and comment below. You can support Closer to Truth by subscribing. Closer to Truth is now accepting your tax-exempt donations. Please come to closertotruth.com forward slash donate. Thank you very much for supporting us and thanks for watching.